It is. Is this Kenny? Yeah, this is Kenny. How you doing? I am fine, Kenny. How are you? I'm doing great. It's a uh, Friday. <laughs> uh, yes, it, thank God. <laughs> Oh, my God. I'm so happy to get to speak with you, Kenny. Oh, same here, too. I, I've already, I spoke with Amy uh, last week. I spoke with Clifton last week. And I got to tell you, this whole film, A Shot Through the Wall, just blew me away, as uh -huh. did your performance. This is a POV we have not seen before. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Everybody talks about white cops, black victims, nobody talked, the Asian community. Right, yeah. So, to see this unfold in such authenticity, thanks to Amy uh, with her tight script and your performance, is just fantastic. Thank you so much. What you bring to Mike is so compelling. And I, as I watched the film progress, and as I watched Mike go further down this rabbit hole with the lawyering and the media and social, and social media, and your body language spoke volumes with your head down, hands in pockets. You could feel the cultural shame that Mike was internalizing for what he was bringing on his family. And that was incredible to watch oh my god thank you for saying all that too because you know as a minority i i'm realizing that i don't expect people to understand those nuances and to feel like you're reflecting that back to me is very rewarding so thank you for saying that and i mentioned it to amy as well it's just amazing to watch that because what she has done, what you have done, along with Zima and Fiona Fu, to a very large degree, is you bring us something we don't see much of anymore, which is respect. Respect mm -hmm. for your elders, respect for culture. Right, absolutely. And that really comes to the forefront here. And Thank she, you. I hope, I hope that it, it did. Um, and, I, and I hope that, you know, a lot of people see it the same way as you, too. Um, because, you know, on the surface, we've had a lot of people say, like, oh, so, you know, we should feel bad for the poor cops now. Like, and that's really not what it's about. So I'm, I'm grateful to you for saying that. This is so not what it's about. It, yeah. Number one, to a degree, it's about a cop who gets, you know, railroaded. Right. So it touches on police corruption within the police unit. But it, it encompasses so much more. And it's really a lot of the collateral damage that comes. Exactly, yes. And that's what nobody thinks about. And even people that are out there in real life situations, and the first thing they do is they want to be on camera, they want to talk about it. What this shows is, no, you don't want to do that. You want, right. to, keep, you want to have respect, respect for the victims, respect for your family, respect for yourself. And you really right. convey that so beautifully. Thank you so much. Most of the credit is Amy's. <laughs> <laughs> Amy wasn't the one on camera. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's the one usually yelling at me, going, Hey, you're too happy. <laughs> yes, you can't be happy. You can't be happy. I know, I know. That was that was tough because, you know, I'm a very naturally like cheerful person and then and then every time the camera turned on she had to remind me, like, Kenny, you just killed somebody. And, and then, oh my gosh, Debbie, I lost 15 pounds on the shoot over the span of seven and a half weeks on accident. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was tough, you know, putting, putting myself there. Given some of your other roles, Midway, Yakuza Princess, um, even Long Road Home, which is a mentally grueling film yeah. for an actor, as is this one. Yeah. What is it about this script, this character of Mike Tan, that really attracted you to the challenges that this role would bring? Uh, that's a great question. Um, honestly, you know, especially at the time, I was still, you know, an up-and-coming actor, so I didn't really have the choices <laughs> to be able to choose my roles. But 
I have noticed that certain projects do choose me, and, and I think maybe there's something in the way that I, you know, carry myself or something, but I do want to tell stories that are meaningful, you know, ones that last. And um, I think that it's crucially important now that we tell stories that are very uh, relevant to something that is happening right now. You know, the sensitive topics, the timely topics that we need to um, put under a lens and understand with a lot of empathy and nuance uh, for us to even start to, like, find a solution towards. Um, those are the types of stories that really I naturally gravitate towards, and I'm, I'm just really lucky that this film found me um, because I do feel like this story is exactly what I've been looking for. Um, so that's what drew me to it. How did you even get into the mindset of Mike? Because I know Amy Bay was inspired to tell this story based on a real life incident. And yeah. at this point in time, I know you, you shot this before the right. most recent, before Black Lives Matter, before the most recent incident here in LA with right. the cops and errant bullet going through the dressing room in a clothing store and killing yeah. a young girl. So it is very timely and topical, but from your perspective, how did you get into the mindset of Mike? Did you do research into the police department, into rookies in particular? Because that's very key here that Mike is a yep. rookie. And he's partnered with another rookie who is only a, a self-serving little brat, personally. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, but. There's, so there's a lot. Um, because, you know, right away, I and obviously Amy knew this too, that, you know, this was something that needed to be told very authentically and very groundedly because of how uh, relevant it was. Um, so first of all, you know, we had to understand the case of the Peter Liang case. Um, so I actually flew to New York uh, several weeks before production began, and I was talking to people that were in New York that actually remember, remember the incident. So I was like walking down, up and down the streets of Manhattan and Brooklyn, talking to locals, uh, what was their impression of it? How did they feel about that incident? What did they think should have happened? Um, I really wanted to understand from that perspective because I think, you know, I can Wikipedia all I want, but that's only like half of really the knowledge. Um, so there's that. And the second thing was I wanted to get a good grasp of what it is to grow up as a Chinese American immigrant in New York that specifically grew up in Brooklyn. Um, Bay Ridge specifically. So then Amy had me spend several weeks there too. I'm just people watching and talking to people in Chinese. Like it's it's really a bizarre place because there's none of the signs are in English. It's like you wouldn't be able to tell it's New York, Brooklyn. Um, so that was the second thing that I did. And the third thing actually was, and it wasn't necessarily just for this film, but I actually applied for the LEPD um, because I was realizing that our stories are becoming kind of parody parodies of themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, we've been telling cop stories since forever, and those images I felt like really needed to be updated. So I decided that I wanted to go see what it's like to be a police officer in this current day and age. So I actually applied to the L.A. Um, police Department, um, and let me tell you, Debbie, the, the way to even become a police officer nowadays is crazy. You, if you saw an application like, like half a foot thick, um, first of all, and they're going through your personal history, like they interview your friends, your relatives, your parents, they do a credit check, they check through like where you've lived, your sex, drug history, like everything. And then just, and then once you pass that, then you go through a week long test of several physical exams, several interrogations. Like I remember I was sitting across from a police sergeant, a professional interrogator, an attorney, and they're asking me questions like, well, why do you want to become a Los Angeles Police Department officer? And um, they're, they're like, and I'm attached to like a lie detector test too. And their driving purpose was to ingrain in your head that, you know, when you're a police officer, you are a representative of your community. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like you, you are a leader and you are meant to protect the people in your community. And it was really staggering to me because, you know, I'm seeing such a different image in the in the news in you know our films and television of what police officers are and i was seeing such a difference with how to even get in right now um and all the people that were applying were such uh upstanding people and really wanting to do something good for for the, their community and that you know that made 
that gap really made me start to think. I was like, wow, is it because of the job that changes you? You know, like maybe you started as this really, you know, intentionally good person and because of your job, your day-to-day work, it changes you into somebody that can, you know, shoot somebody in the back on accident or even intentionally or, you know. And so that really, um, really shattered like my, my perception. And then um, the very last thing, <laughs> sorry, this is getting a little long, but um, uh, right before I, I filmed The Shop of the Wall, I was filming The Long Road Home, and that is also inspired by a true story. Um, it's similar to Black Hawk Down. It's a group of American soldiers getting ambushed in Sauter City, Iraq. And my character had to do some awful things in order to survive that conflict. For example, killing innocent women and children. And so my experience there actually lended very... Um, a, a lot of clarity to this one because experiencing the violence of a gun shooting somebody and killing someone in cold blood is a feeling that I'll never forget. Um, and it, I, I borrowed a lot from that experience um, shooting that um, into, into this one as well. Well, and here we've got a very powerful scene in a shot through the wall where, you know, after the bullet has gone awry, and Mike runs into the apartment, there is somebody bleeding out. Yeah. And yeah. it's very visceral. Right. V- very visceral, very vivid. But <clears throat> I so appreciate the fact that you put so much into preparing and getting mm-hmm. into this character. It shows on screen, Kenny. Oh, thank you so much, Debbie. <laughs> it shows on screen. How beneficial was it for you being from an immigrant Chinese family, you get to speak Chinese. But what I really love here is the cultural respect, the family dinner, the whole idea of food. Right. I connected with this whole family immigrant dynamic yeah. immediately. Yeah, and, you know, with the whole idea of the food and the family table. And it doesn't matter how old you are, when your elders are sitting there, you shut up and you show them respect. Right, yeah. How important was that for you to have all of that and be a part of that? Because I suspect that this has been what you've grown up with. Oh, definitely. I mean, it was so gratifying to be able to show elements of my culture, like, on the screen. And, you know, it's not just the Chinese culture, but, you know, a big part of it is an immigrant culture. Um, me growing up Chinese American in America, you know, you kind of grow up having two faces, you know, like you have a very different personality when you're interacting out there in the world, like at school, at your work, and you have a very different personality when you go home. And being able to showcase that in this film, it was, it was very natural, finally. <laughs> like, you know, something that I was like, oh, I could finally just, you know, be myself at home. Um, that was very gratifying. And secondly, you know, I felt a lot of responsibility, but also um, I'm just very proud to be able to to show that because, you know, a huge challenge that Asian Americans have had is we're constantly seen as the foreigner. We're constantly seen as people that don't belong here. And this a Shop of the Wall is a very American story. And at the center of it is a Chinese American family. And so it kind of bridges that gap from like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, we're always left out of the conversation, you know, of social justice as if we don't belong here. But we do. We're like fundamentally wrapped up in the middle of it. And to see how a Chinese American family deals with this very American problem, I think is something that a lot of Asian Americans really needed. Um, because without that connection, we're constantly going to be seen as a foreigner. And we're constantly going to be seen as, oh, you're, the, you're to blame for the China virus when so many of these Asian people aren't even Chinese or, you know, don't have never even been in China before, you know? So that's, that's how I feel about how important it is to bridge that gap. I got to ask, because we, we do spend a lot of time with food uh, yeah. in, in this film. We have the big dinner gathering where Chief Walker shows up and Candace is there. Then we have other food prep times where... You know, mom doesn't think that, that Grace is doing things right. How was the food? Um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> we, uh, let's just say that uh, every time we had a dinner scene, uh, the food was all gone, and Amy had to remind us not to 
uh, eat the props. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Oh my god! Um, I take it that you were not eating Panda Express Chinese food. No, no. Amy actually went to very. Specific, she when she wrote it, she said that she saw very specific dishes on a table, and you know that I guess is her kind of Easter egg ish type thing, where you know each dish kind of represents a certain emotion or a certain um, thing, and so. She wanted the very specific dishes, and some of which we couldn't find at restaurants. So then she actually, I think she had a friend, or I think Fiona, the the actress who plays the mother, mm -hmm. a very good cook, and she actually made a bunch of the dishes that were that were being served. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I think Amy said that um, told me that she went to Fiona's like uh, Airbnb or something, and they're cooking the night before a shoot. You know, so it was it was that type of a thing, and you know, it, for immigrant cultures, I guess especially, it's the food is so important because it communicates a lot that words can't. Yes, and, and that's what she wanted there on camera too. Oh, j trust me, I know that. It's like the big thing is you go to grandma's house. There are certain specific dishes that you had to have on the table. That's right. Yeah, um, exactly. No questions asked. They had to be there, and they had to be cooked a certain way, or or desserts baked a certain way. Yeah. So I really related to the importance of food in the cultural dynamic in a shot through the wall. Uh, another another big thing here that I love because each one of the Tan family represent a different element, a different point in the timeline of immigrants in America. You've got mom, who's still very, very, very traditional. Dad, who is a really nice blend right. of the old world and America. Lynn, who's very forward. Her, great, great, her character, Grace, is very much, very much Americanized. And then there's Mike, who's kind of caught in between. But yeah. we see all the different stages of acclimation, so to speak. Yeah. And one that really stands out is through the entire film with mom who kept saying, you should just go say I'm sorry. You should just go say I'm sorry. And that's such an old world yeah. idea. Right. And I love how that played out here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I, I think, I think. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. You know, I think uh, on the surface of a, a story like this, centered or loosely based on a case like this, it's very easy to uh, politicize it and to see as, you know, this is just another statistic. You know, oh, another police officer accidentally or intentionally kills a black man, but then the human element of it is lost. You know, like, what is justice? It, does he need to go to jail? Is that it? You know, it's not so cut and dry. And I think what Mike needs to learn at the end, and he does, is that there's, it's a film about the collateral damage. Mm -hmm. It's not just himself and the victim. It's all the people around, both of them, that are being severely affected by this. And, and you know, his clumsy solution, and maybe in some ways the one that needed to be done, is he, he wants to go apologize to the mother. And he does. And, and that's, that's how I see it, too, is in that there's, we forget that, you know, in the midst of all this political discourse, we forget that at the center of human beings. And we need to remember that. I absolutely love that, that aspect of this and the generational timeline of acclamation that we see unfold. Something else is very unique about this film. We also have Mike in an interracial relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, we got the whole ball of wax here, Kenny. Uh, I know, there's a lot to unpack. And, you know, Amy, this is a great job of blending it all together. Uh, a bunch, of, I'm, I'm so grateful I'm talking to you because I feel like a lot of people that have seen it um, that aren't a minority generally, like, did not see a lot of the cultural nuances and the importance of it, um, how it's essential to understanding really what is going on emotionally big part of it is people have to have you have to live a life you have to open yourself up to the world and it gives you a perspective right that a lot of people 
they don't have that perspective and they don't want to know that perspective. And that's the sad thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially now, it's like people seem like they feel like they know everything already. And the tragedy of that is once you feel like you know, then you stop looking. That's what I love with this film is because the blinders come off. Mm-hmm. The blinders come off, and then you are you are the one that lead us through this journey. And you you really, Kenny, I can't say enough about your performance. It really, it is so moving. It is so incredible. And the authenticity, just, it, it's there on the screen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. As an actor, because this is really your first huge role. This is your film to lose. Just so you know that, it's your film to lose, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> but because this is such a big role for you, leading role and tackling such a big subject with all these subchapters happening, what did you, as an actor, learn about yourself? That you can, and also because I'm tapping into your engineer's brain here as well. <laughs> yeah. Because engineering is very specific. It's right. very compartmentalized. It's very exacting. Yeah. Uh, and if something is off the slightest, something ain't going to work. Absolutely. So I'm curious what you learned about yourself with this role that you can now take forward into your future performances. Um, you know, I think I found a, a lot more clarity in my purpose. You know, like... you. You can become an actor, but there's a lot of different kinds of actors. And the stories that I want to tell are the ones that are very similar to this one. You know, I want to update the images that we have. Um, I want to uh, tell a meaningful story, one that is lasting, um, one that is a commentary on something that is reflective now. You know, we have so many um, hero's journey, like superhero type films, and they're universal and that's what makes them great. But then what I think gets lost is that we stop analyzing ourselves now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because we, as a culture, have a lot to learn with things changing so quickly. Um, we have a lot to learn. And so I hope to continue telling stories just like this. Um, that's, that's my biggest thing, um, is finding a lot of purpose in the specifics of what kind of stories that I want to put out there. Um, secondly... Um, you know, it's really amazing now that we have Crazy Rich Asians, we have Shang-Chi out, and, you know, Asian stories are very bankable now, and so people want to see more Asian stories. Um, I do see the world as very wide open uh, right now for, for Asian stories, um, and I want to tell more stories that tie uh, Asians into the fabric of America. Um, there's, you know, the story of, like, the 442nd Infantry Regiment, which is the most decorated United U.S. military uh, group in the history of the U.S. military, and they're basically the Japanese Americans who, you know, were interned and decided to still um, fight for America in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's stories like that that I feel like didn't get covered so much. Like when I was going to my history classes in my public education, it's you know, it's very black and white like our history and. Um, at least the way it's presented to us. And so I want to I wanna tell stories that incorporate into the fabric of America more so we bridge that gap of understanding. See, and I, and I love that. I love that. And I love those kind of stories. Of course, I'm also one of those anal people that if it's missing in the curriculum, I go, I go look for it. <laughs> yeah. I go look for it. And I highly suspect that you do the same thing. Absolutely. I, I kind of had to, you know, because then otherwise it's like, well, where, where do I belong? <laughs> where do I fit? So now, do you have anything upcoming on your plate that you can talk about yet? Well, I, I'm i very fortunate. Um, there's several of the projects that I worked on before. Um, people have reached out to me and said that, hey, I want to attach you as a lead in this next project that I'm developing. Um, so I can't say them too much, but there's two TV shows and there's two films that I'm attached to. Still early in development, um, but the 
fact that it's happening is is something that's really wonderful. So, hey, we'll see what happens. Hey, fingers crossed, Kenny. I can, this has been so wonderful to get to talk to you, Kenny. Oh. I loved your little your little piece in Midway. I, I really enjoyed Yakuza Princess. I am so thrilled to see you grapple and tackle a role like this in A Shot Through the Wall. I can't yeah. wait to see what you do next. And I hope we get to talk again. I know. Same, Debbie. Let me know anytime because I really thoroughly enjoyed this um, because I feel like, the, you know, my interviews, sometimes the questions tend to be, you know, very boilerplate. But then, you know, you really have something that you really relate to deeply. And that's that's really rewarding to talk about. Oh, I'm I'm so glad. Thank you, thank you for that, Kenny. Well, you go off. It's Friday. <laughs> it's I, Friday. I, but you are a hell of a way to kick off my Friday. Let me tell you, Kenny. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Debbie. And until next time, you have a great weekend, and hopefully, we'll talk soon. Thank you. You too. We will talk soon. Mm -hmm.